Previously, we showed you how we found a vulnerability in a DNS parser exposed through a router's wide array network connection. Today, we'll dive deep into it and work around its limitations to build a surprisingly complex exploit. So buckle up and join us on an epic journey to get that sweet remote root shell. Hey, this is Pedro from the Flashback team. In order to write an exploit, you need to have a deep understanding of the underlying vulnerability. In our previous video, Radek showed you how we found the vulnerability and gave you a good walkthrough of it. I will now summarize it, but if you really want to understand it, you need to have watched the previous video. If you didn't, you're just a noob. The premise is as follows. Our router sends a DNS request and then receives a DNS reply, which is parsed by the con indicator binary. There is a stack overflow in this binary when parsing the response. The first parsing function is TP DNS receive and resolve. This function receives the DNS reply and stores it in the DNS answer stack variable. This DNS answer stack variable is then passed on to process resolved IP, which as the name implies, does some processing on it. The actual parser function is DNS answer parser, which takes the DNS answer received by TP DNS and resolve and the DNS query buff, which is a stack variable from process resolved IP. DNS answer parser then processes packets in a loop. If the two most significant bits of the first byte are not set, then it expects a length byte followed by a string of that length. And the loop will keep processing length and string in this format until it finds a null byte instead of a length. Since there is no check for the size of the receiving buffer, DNS query buff, then we can just send several length string, length string sequences until we overwrite the buffer and finally hit the registers and the return address. This might still not be clear, so let's review a minute and a half of the previous video and watch Radek explaining the vulnerability. Target receives our data. We need to set our code to zero to enter a relevant switch case. As you want to avoid domain parsing branch, let's set QD count to zero. We need to have at least one answer, so let's set an count to one. Okay, now we enter process resolved IP. We didn't parse any questions yet, so we're gonna go straight to DNS answer parser function. We take first byte from the DNS answer section. It cannot be zero, and it also cannot be a value larger than hex 3f, so we don't enter this compression mode part, but go straight to our beautiful mem copy. So our first byte is len. Let's have it set to hex 3f followed by a corresponding size of a's. This will be written into our vulnerable buffer. On the next iteration, we execute this mem copy over here. As the vulnerable buffer DNS query buff is 260 bytes in size, we need to execute in a loop at least five times. The remaining fields don't play a role in the execution path. So this is the game plan. We just need to make sure we fulfill all of these conditions and we land in the vulnerable code. Wait, before we go on, I th there's something wrong about it. Can you spot it? Ah, much better now. So we're back into Ghidra, which is really what we love doing. This is the process resolve IP function. On the right hand side, we have the decompiler view. On the left hand side, we have the disassembler view. And now to try to understand a little bit more of the vulnerability, why don't we start looking at what the function does at the start. First, the function sets up its stack of 260 hex. Then it proceeds to save the registers it's going to use S0 to S8 one by one. And also it saves the return address. 
and this return address is our target. To understand why, let's go to the end of the function and see what it does just before it exits. And here, at the end of the function, we can see it does the opposite of what it does when it starts executing. It loads all the saved registers from the stack and then jumps to RA, which is the return address. So I think by now you understand why overriding that return address is crucial. If the function jumps to a memory address that is stored in RA, and if we can control that memory address, we take control of execution and we win. Now, have you noticed something odd about the return address? So it seems that it's jumping to return address and then after that, adjusting the stack. How can this happen? Because if we jump to return address, we're already executing somewhere else, right? Well, the MIPS architecture has this thing called the delay slot, which means that it executes two instructions in parallel, more or less. So the jump to array and the stack adjustment are happening at the same time. This doesn't matter much for now, but keep it in mind for exploitation later down the line. Let's go back to the top of the function, and now let's look at the actual stack. Here we have the stack view with all its variables. Our target is DNS query buff. This buffer is 260 bytes in size, and we can see its location on the stack. The variable starts at OX134, and it's OX104 bytes in size, right? Which is 260. And after that, we have a couple of local variables, our saved S registers, and finally, our target RA. What does this mean? It means that we need to overwrite hex 130 bytes until we reach RA. And the hex 130th to 134th bytes will be our return address. We understand the stack better. Let's look at our game plan again. On the top, you see number 0 to 15. These are the number of bits. Each field will have 16 bits or two bytes. Let's make our exploit in Python. Remember, looking at the game plan, we know we have to send an ID of 16 bits. Let's just copy the one from the example packet in the slides we showed earlier. We can also copy the flags. The only thing we need to make sure is our code is zero, and it is zero in the value that we put OX80. Then we use two bytes to set QD count to zero then another two bytes to set AN count to one, and two bytes each to set NS count and AR count to zero, and we build our packet with all of these. Then we need to build our DNS answer section, which will contain the payload, 3F followed by a corresponding number of A's, and this is defined in the answer parser loop size, which is 3F. We repeat the same loop four times. So we send one hex 3f byte followed by hex 3f a's. Why four times? Well, let's pull out our calculator. 3f plus one times four equals x 100. If our calculations are correct, then we need to send an extra four bytes to fill in the rest of the buffer, because remember the buffer is 260 or hex 104 in size. Then after that, we have local 30 and local 2c, two stack variables that we don't really care about. And now the juicy part starts, which are our registers S0 to S8, which we'll fill in with ASCII numbers. And now, if our calculations are correct, the next four bytes are going to be our return address, which we're going to set to hex 50 50 50 50. We finally send a null byte indicating that processing should stop, and then we send our packet to the target. If you follow the calculations correctly, you will realize that we're actually sending hex 135 bytes, not hex 134. See if you can find out why and tell us in the comments. Okay, fingers crossed, now we're gonna run the POC on the real device and see what happens. Now on the right hand side, we have a shell to our target router. We start GDB server there and attach to the con indicator binary. GDB server allows us to connect remotely 
using the GDB from our own computer to the target device and debug it on the device. Here you can see my GDB setup. This is Jeff. It's a plugin that enhances GDB's capabilities, especially for exploiters. There's other alternatives such as the PwnDBG and the unfortunately named PIDA. What these do, these are a collection of scripts that really make your life easier on GDB and present information in an easier way. You know, there are some people out there that dislike these plugins and like to use plain old GDB and call themselves super lead for that. But in my opinion, they're just a bunch of noobs. Anyway, we got our environment running. Let's find out which port con indicator is running. And then let's fire our proof of concept and see what happens. Yes, dogs, we made it. Look at that, everything's perfect. All the registers are exactly the same values that we entered. And here's our return address, 50, 50, 50, 50. And it's trying to execute that address. So now we're done, right? That's it. Well, not really. I mean, we're taking control of execution, but we're just crashing it. Let's think about the next steps now. In order to understand how we can exploit this, first let's look at the protections that this binary con indicator has. For this, we look at the virtual memory map. Look at this, the stack is executable. I was not expecting this. This will probably make our life a lot easier. Now, let's see if the binary has ASLR enabled. ASLR is address space layo randomization. What does this mean? It means that every time the program restarts, it will relocate itself to another memory address. This is a problem for us exploiters. If we don't know the correct memory address that we need to execute, then the program will crash. And unlike some targets, this one does not restart automatically, so we only have one try. To test for SLR, I'm going to run this script that you see on the screen. All this does is start con indicator, check the memory mappings, kill itself, wait 5 seconds and do it all over again. If the memory mappings are different at each run, ASLR is enabled. Ok, we can see that actually ASLR is enabled for everything except for the binary itself. This is both good and bad news. Let's summarize then. We have an executable stack. We have ASLR enabled in everything except the binary. What can we achieve with this? If we can control the stack values and jump to the stack, then we have a straight up win. Because the CPU will start executing our code in the stack, we take control and can do whatever we want. We know that we can control the RA value so we can execute code at whatever memory address we know. But now, how do we go from there to jumping to the stack? Let me introduce you to ROPE, Return Oriented Programming. Return Oriented Programming is just a fancy term for reusing existing application code to do our bidding. Let me give you a couple of examples. Let's look at the stack diagram of process resolved IP, which we already know pretty well. And here on the left hand side, we see the function exit, which again, we already know pretty well. I have just summarized it to loading the saved return address, jumping to it and adjusting the stack pointer. Let's start executing it. We adjust our return address, RA, to a fake 1337 address in the program. This address does not exist in the real program. I'm putting it here just for demonstration. And let's assume the code at that address simply moves the stack pointer to the T9 register and then jumps to the T9 register. We exit process resolved IP. We jump to 1337. We execute the code there. And then we jump into our stack. What we did is called a stack pivot. And now we're executing our shell code that is in the stack. That's easy to understand, right? It's pretty simple. Now let's look at a more complex example. 
let's look again at the stack of process resolved IP. Now we extended the overflow by 104x and we also added the loading of S1 and S0 as we exit the function. We point our return address to hex1337, which we also call gadget1. The code at this location loads the return address again from a stack location 100x from the stack pointer. Then it moves S0 to the A0 register and finally jumps to array and adjusts the stack. Our extended overflow allows us to put a second return address at hex100. This one will point to 40, 30. What's on this address is what we call gadget2. It simply moves S1 to T9 and then jumps to the address contained in the T9 register, which remember was S1 before. Let's start executing our code then. We execute the return of process resolved IP. We load RA, S1 and S0 from the stack that we control. We jump to the return address and adjust our stack pointer. Our return address contains 1337. That's gadget 1. Now we're executing gadget 1. We load the return address from 100x from the current stack pointer. We move S0 to A0 and we jump to that return address. That return address is 4030, gadget 2. Here we move S1 to T9 and then we jump to T9. Can you guess what we just did? What we did is to call the function whose address is stored at S1 with S0 as a parameter. And remember, we control both because these values are taken from the stack and put in the registers when we exit process resolved IP. In this way, you can understand how we can build a complex program just reusing pieces of the code which already exist in the code. We don't add anything new. We simply manipulate existing instructions. How do we find these ROP gadgets? There are two ways, automated, with tools, or manually browsing the disassembly code. Let's start with automation. There are many tools for hunting ROP gadgets, but I like two in particular, ROP gadget and ROPper. These are easily installable with Python pip and very easy to run. It's better to use more than one tool, as different tools work better with different binaries. We can see that here. Rob Gadget found 2035 gadgets in Con Indicator, but Ropper only found 870. That's not a lot, because Con Indicator is a small 60 kilobyte binary. The examples I showed earlier were the very best scenarios, and in practice it's very hard to find gadgets like that especially in such a small binary. We went through these gadget lists and we could not find a gadget or combination of gadgets that work for us. We need to take the manual approach. After three long days and sleepless nights, we finally have our solution. Before we dive into it, let's review our call diagram. What if I told you that while the call diagram is correct, the stack view is not to make it correct, let's apply a mirror to it. Here it is. Feeling more confused now? Well, let me explain. The stack is a bit of a weirdo when it comes to programming when compared to other data structures such as the heap. In essence, stack space is allocated or given to a function from higher addresses to lower addresses. But it's also important to understand that memory is still written to from lower addresses to higher addresses. We start con indicator, and for simplicity, let's ignore that any functions are called before tpdns receive and resolve. As we saw in the memory map, the stack is ox21000 in size. The stack pointer points to the highest address of the stack, which is in the bottom of our picture. What is the first thing the function does? It allocates a stack of oxd00. Note that it is subtracting from the stack pointer, so it's going from a higher address to a lower address. The stack variables are filled in, and then it calls process resolved IP. Process resolved IP will follow the same process, allocating a stack by subtracting OX260 from the stack pointer and put its variables there. Note the image is not to scale. 
Now, process result IP will call DNS answer parser, which again will allocate a stack, blah blah, do all the same, we don't need to show it again. At this point, our overflow happens in the DNS query buff stack variable, which is part of process resolved IP stack. Note that if we continue our overflow long enough, we will be able to overflow the stack of TP DNS receive and resolve. But actually, we don't need to do that, and I will show you why. After the overflow, the process happens in reverse. Process resolved IP exits, and does so by adding to the stack pointer OX260. Now, if we hadn't overflowed the return address, TP DNS receive and resolve would do the same thing as it exits, cleaning up after itself and adding OXD00 to the stack pointer. And the stack pointer is again pointing to the highest address of the stack. Again, to summarize, stack space is allocated from high addresses to lower addresses, but memory is written to from lower addresses to higher addresses. Okay. I made you go through this so that you understand the next step. Let's look at our stack in GDB when we exit process resolved IP, just before our return address is abused and we take control of execution. Here's our payload in DNS query buff. But notice, the exact same payload is just a few bytes after it. What magic is this? Well, let's look at our stack diagram. That's the DNS sensor from where the data was copied from. Remember, the overflow happens when we take the data from DNS sensor and copy it to DNS query buff. So that's why we have the payload duplicated in memory. And now, with this in mind, let's show you our black magic trick to abuse this and take control of execution. Let's start at a high level. Here's our master ownage plan. First, we copy our command to a memory address that is readable and writable. But we have a SLR, right? How can we know an address? Simple. We abuse the binary's data section, which is writable. And if you recall, the con indicator binary itself does not use a SLR, so this data section is always mapped to the same address. Then, we set up A0, argument 0, to point to the data at section address with our command. And finally, we call system with our command. One important detail. System, despite being a libc function, and libc is randomized with ASLR, it is also imported into the binary, so it will always be at a fixed address of OX 40 20 E0. Seems simple enough, right? Well, as always, the devil is in the details. There are a few things we need to have in mind when building our payload. And to understand what's going on, let's jump into Ghidra. Here we are inside process resolved IP, just after we exit DNS answer parser, which performed the overflow on process resolved IP stack variables. After this, there is a mem copy which copies the answer flag stack variable and then a whole bunch of if clauses that check various conditions. Then, at the end of the loop, the variable i is incremented, and we jump back to the beginning of the do while loop. i is compared to a n count, the number of answers received in a packet, and if it matches, param4 and param5 are checked to see if they're null, and we finally exit the function. Let's verify how we can fulfill these conditions. To bypass all of these ifs after the answer flags mem copy, we can simply set answer flex to zero. That will be 10 bytes. Then, here at the end of the loop, S8 contains our i variable, and that's incremented by one. We go back to the start of the loop and see that S8 or i is compared to the an count variable. Where exactly is an count stored? Let's look at the stack. Look here, an count is saved to the stack after our return address. Note how the return address is saved to minus four of the stack pointer offset, and then come the arguments DNS answer section, an count, param4, and param5. These are all saved to the stack at the start of this function.
This means that if we overwrite pasta return address, we need to make sure that an count matches the value in S8, otherwise we will not enter the if clause and exit the function. This will probably cause everything to crash. We also need to make sure that param4 and param5 are set to zero, so that we bypass these inner if clauses. This is very important, and we will do this in our exploit. We won't show you in GDB to keep things simple, but keep that in mind. With this knowledge, let's jump into GDB before we exit process resolved IP and jump into our first gadget. At this point, we have overwritten our stack and bypassed the conditions we just described. Let's load or control registers from the stack, S0 to S8 and RA. Notice the value of S8. It's a bunch of Fs or minus 1. This will be important for our second gadget. S5 is another important register. We load this with the data address section that we will overwrite. And we load the same address in S2. The other registers we don't really care about, as you can see from the dummy OX30, 31, 33, etc. values. Let's check our stack. Here we are working on the overflowed buffer DNS query buff. And if you look below us, there will be our second payload DNS sensor. Remember, we have our payload duplicated in the stack as we explained earlier, and we will use this. Now let's jump into our first gadget. This is at OX403AF4, and we're executing our first gadget. We load RA with the address of the second gadget. Then we move S2, which points to our data section, which we'll overwrite, to V0. We don't care about the new values of S2 and S1, but we do care about the value of S0, which we set to hex 100. Now let's jump to gadget 2, which is at OX405110. It will mem copy our command into the binaries data section. Notice the mem copy arguments. A0 is our data section address, A1 is our command, and A2 comes from S0 with a branch delay slot, which is hex 100. Perfect. Our command will be copied to the data section as we want. Let's check this data section contents. Contains some garbage. We set a breakpoint after the mem copy and run it. And we check our data section again. Excellent. Our command was written to it. Does this address look familiar? Let's look at it in Ghidra. Look. We're inside process resolved IP. That's right, we decided to abuse the function a second time. This time we abuse it to memcopy your command from the stack to the data section. But now we have a problem. Remember what we explained earlier about overflowing an count, param4, param5, and the problems that causes? We need to bypass those checks again. Earlier, we set our S8 value to minus 1. Now that finally becomes useful, as S8 is the I loop variable. We add 1 to it, and it becomes 0. This time, we overflowed A and count to have a value of 0, and set param4 and param5 to 0 too, so we enter the if that exits the function. Once again, perfect. Let's continue in GDB. We finish our mem copy, bypass all the conditions we just explained, and now we land again at process resolved IP's function exit. As we advance our stack pointer, we're now working with a second copy of the payload in memory, the DNS answer variable. Nice. We load array with our third and final gadget. Also importantly, notice how S5, which we set earlier to our address where our command was copied to, is moved to V0. We don't care about any other registers at this point. Let's go to the final gadget, which is at address OX406CE8. 
Here we are in our third and final gadget. V0, our command, is moved to A0. And we load our return address from the stack, ox 402 0 e0 which is the address of system, and we jump to it. And now we're executing system with our command in A0. Let's stop here, as your mom is amazing, but it's not a valid command. We want a reverse shell. We will now run the exploit outside of GDB. Let's look at our exploit before we run it one final time. Here you can see all the stack being carefully set, with all the gadgets, each registers individual values, an count, param4, param5, all our friends are showing up to this party. Our command is inserted at the end of our payload. It can be a max of ox3e or 62 characters, which is plenty. We will spare you the pain of going line by line. We have published the exploit and advisory, and you can look at them yourself with a fresh mind. One final fact for you. We take advantage of our payload being twice in the stack with these three gadgets. But one key factor is that the duplicated stack payloads have a different alignment in memory. When our payload is copied from DNS sensor to DNS query buff, the loop will insert additional dots and remove the length bytes. This will cause a misalignment between the two stack variables, which we have to work around by inserting alignment and padding bytes into our ROP chain. That's also the reason that an count is 1 in the first process resolved IP call and 0 in the second one. Yeah, pretty nice. Our journey is almost done. Let's run our exploit outside GDB together. As an argument, it takes the target's IP address, the UDP port con indicator is listening on, and our command. For the command, let's use this payload. It's a simple, Telnet based reverse shell connection to the attacker. Let's run it and see what happens. There we go. We win. Wait, we're missing an important step here. But you know what? I'll let Radek handle it. But before that, all the content we put on our YouTube channel, all the advisories and exploits we release, that's all free and sponsored by our own training. Do you enjoy watching our videos, learning new hacking techniques and finding and exploiting vulnerabilities? And why don't you come to our Embedded Device Hacking course, which we regularly host all over the world, live in person. There are many hardware, embedded device hacking, IoT exploitation courses out there, but ours is truly unique. Why is that, Rado? We focus only on real vulnerabilities that we or other hacker find. And as you can see from our videos, we have a lot of experience hacking real devices, in both to own or our day jobs. The goal of the course is to teach you how to take apart embedded devices by analyzing the hardware obtaining the firmware, reverse engineer it, find a vulnerability and exploit it. Our mottos are no fake wounds and POC or GTFO. For more details, check our website and get your ticket now. Yo. This is Radek from the Flashback team. Okay, Pedro, I see you have a lot of fun here, but there is a problem. Your exploit only works on local area network, LAN, and you must know what source port was used for the query. That's a bit lame if you ask me. I will make it to work over the white area network interface, one. Let me put on my network engineering hat and introduce you to my dear friend, Contrac. Okay, I will make this exploit great again. But first, I need to fix something. Yeah, much better now. So, what is Contrac, aka connection tracking? Imagine you have a computer that is connected to a firewall which controls traffic. It can be a separate device or IP tables on the same machine. 
If you are initiating a connection, that connection needs to be allowed on the firewall. You create a rule and you're good to go. But after you send that packet somewhere to the internet, you are waiting for the response data. And you would need to make a firewall to allow that data so it is not blocked. And here is the thing. There are two firewall types, stateless and stateful. If a firewall is a stateless type, you would need to create another firewall rule on the incoming interface in order to allow that traffic to pass. However, in the stateful firewall, the connection is tracked. Firewall remembers that you have sent a legitimate outgoing packet to the server and it will match incoming data to that request and simply accept it, without the need for the extra rule. On Linux-based systems, this mechanism is called connection tracking, contract in short. So what does it mean for us hackers? That there is a small window of opportunity that a firewall is open for the internet facing wide area network connections. Remember, when we were scanning wide area network one interface, everything was closed, but we can abuse contract in order to deliver our exploit over the internet. And while it might be more challenging to spoof TCP packets, our target, con indicator, uses UDP, which makes entire spoofing operation much easier. We just need to guess the UDP port that is waiting for an answer and spoof the IP address for which a response is expected. And contract will open the firewall's door for us. How awesome! Let's have a look on the target itself. With contract minus capital L, I can list all active connections. All matching incoming traffic will be allowed by a firewall. So I mentioned the window of opportunity is short. Let's see how long the contract will be open for UDP packets. Hmm, okay, just 60 seconds, not much. But I have good news. Con indicator doesn't stop sending DNS requests after it received a valid response. It is sending it all the time. So, in fact, it's not a window of opportunity, but a window wide open. Putting it all together, we can bypass that firewall. Let's own it. I took Pedro's decent exploit and improved it. Like this, it should work in real life scenario. First of all, we need to work under condition that we don't know what DNS IP address has been used by a target. But in reality, only a handful of most common ones are usually used. So I have put a few common IP addresses into our spoof list. We'll be sending spoofed DNS responses for each IP address. Secondly, we don't know what source port was used by target. Therefore, we need to brute force it. We take entire pool of available ports and we'll try one by one. And lastly, for performance reasons, let's use threads so we don't need to wait long. I think 20 threads will be enough. Usage is quite simple. We need to specify our host, that is the IP address of the target. Command, this is the command that will be executed by an exploit. Spoof list, a file with spoofed IP addresses, and last but not least, eFace, a network interface on which we should start spoofing. Let me explain our test network. Our target is connected on the 5.10.15.0 network. Attacker is on the completely another network, 13.3.3.0. And there is another network attached, which is a default routing path to reach the internet. For simplicity, we keep everything connected to one router, but you can think of it as a distributed network as you would find in your ISP. During our campaign, the attack will be launched from 13.3.3.7 it will be routed to 5.10.15.100, that is our target. Upon successful execution of the exploit, we will receive a reverse shell. Exciting! Let's cast spells now and let the magic happen. Go! You can see it is attempting 1.1.1.1 spoofed address first. I bet there are a lot of packets hitting that target right now. Okay. It didn't find a way through that firewall with 
1.1.1.1 IP address. It attempts with 8.8.8.8 IP address now. Yeah, and there we go. We got reverse shell from the target. We win. If you watched the entire video carefully, you might have noticed something special about the transaction ID that we have used in our exploit. It was set to a static value. And if it wasn't for this very little detail, our entire attack might have failed big time. Why is that, you ask? Well, let's have a quick look at the RFC document from um, 1987. You are already familiar with this diagram. It's a DNS packet specification. Each DNS packet begins with ID field. ID field is a 16-bit identifier assigned by the program that generates any kind of query. This identifier is copied the responding reply and can be used by the requester to match up replies to outstanding queries. So what do you say TP-Link? Important? Nah. Con indicator ignores transaction ID verification completely. It will just accept anything. You can imagine, if transaction ID would have been properly checked on the DNS response packet, you would need to generate way more spoofed packets in order to find a valid response. Maybe even making the entire attack impractical. We win.